So good morning, everyone. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for the opportunity to present my work. So today I will talk about um, HSP90 and about identifying new and characterizing new Koshapon for HSP90. Um, so just to introduce the subject in general, uh, one of the main function of the cell is actually to maintain most of the protein into their active state. And so there is many system dedicated to that. There is of course the the uh, ubiquitin system that's going to degrade protein that are inactivated, but we also have the chaperone that will bring back or help protein to reach their stable active state. So there is many of these system, uh, but today I will talk about uh, mainly HSP70 and HSP90. So just to summarize, um, Theo already presented this uh, rapidly, but when we have a client protein, so a protein that is misfolded, it will be taken over by HSP40s like uh, DNA JB6. Uh, and then this HSP40 will bring the clients, recruit it to HSP70, in which it forms a ternary complex and in presence of ATP, HSP70 will start a cycle of unfolding and refolding of the client. And for most protein, this is actually enough and the protein can reach the active stable state. But for many other specific protein like kinases or hormone receptor, that's not enough and we require HSP90. So the first step is to actually transfer this complex here to HSP90. And this is done by this Kosha on hop that connects physically HSP70 to HSP90. We then have the transfer of the client. And then upon binding to ATP, HSP90 is going to close and is going to recruit new Kosha prone that will help the, the folding of the, the client. Uh, so this is already quite a complex pathway, but in reality, especially in human, this is even more complicated than that because we have over 50 different co-chaperons that are gonna modulate and regulate different steps along this path. And so this is what we are interested in, trying to understand those co-chaperons, identify them and characterize them. Um, but the first part of the project was more focused on HSP90. So HSP90 is a large protein, it's around 170 kilo Dalton, it's a dimer. Uh, it has also large conformational changes. So from a completely uh, open state that is not particularly well defined to a completely closed state in presence of ATP. So it's difficult to study by crystallography and even electron microscopy. Uh, it's composed of three domains that have independent function, but for co-chaperone binding and client binding, all the domain have to be there. So if we want to study HSP90, we have to study the full lens protein with the three domains. So for this, we cannot work with standard uh, proton nitrogen experiment. We have to use metals. And so the first part of my postdoc was actually to assign the metal resonances of HSP90. So there is many different ways to do this. And I will just describe quickly the, the strategy that we chose. So as I said, uh, HSP90 has three domains and these three domains can actually be expressed independently. So they are still quite large, but much better than the full lens protein. So we can express those. We can actually measure them. They give actually very nice spectra on the proton nitrogen dimensions. And from there, we can do the backbone assignment. So with those three protein, we, get, we got about 80 to 90% assignment of the full lens protein in the isolated domain. And so then we, use, we will use this backbone assignment as a, as a base for assigning the metal. We then produced a fully uh, white original sample with fully deteriorated protein, but also fully carbon labeled and in which only the proton are, uh, only the methyl of uh, protons so on ILV. And this allows us to then run experiments that will uh, correlate the, the methyl uh, resonances to the side chains. And so then we can just compare those experiments, so those toxic-based experiments to our backbone assignment to assign through bound our methyls. Um, of course, since we don't have a full complete backbone assignment, that's not enough for the full assignment of the methyl. So in parallel on the same sample, we can run uh, 3D noses. So through space that we can use the structure then to, to assign the remain methyls. And with this strategy, we could assign uh, all the methyls in the isolated domains. So once this is done, we can move on to the full lens protein. Uh, th that's the spectrum that we obtain. So this time we have a more traditional uh, labeling with fully deteriorated protein and only the methyl carbon labeled and prot uh, with protonated with MILV. And from there, we can just transfer the, the assignment of the isolated domain and we can validate it and extend it slightly using the uh, NOSI, the 3D NOSI experiments. So we're using this strategy 
in the end, we could assign around 75% of uh, the methyl of HSP90, which is around 125 uh, methyls that are well spread over the whole uh, structure. So that's good to continue then. Uh, so this approach is definitely not the fastest. It took about a year and a half to get the full assignment, but it's a very safe approach because it's full bound and validated through space. And also as a bonus, we also get the assignment of the isolated domain that we can use afterward. So once it's done, we could start looking at co-chaperons. And today I'm gonna to talk about uh, this protein here that is not C, that, uh, and it started from the collaborators. So our biologist collaborators established a CRISPR assay in which they essentially created individual cell lines into, in which a single uh, gene is knocked out. And so they knocked out all the genes that are linked to proteostasis. And we just looked in those cell lines at the uh, activation of GR. So GR is a, a client of HSP90 that uh, absolutely requires HSP90 for its activity. So once this, when this protein is activated, it means that HSP90 pathway is functional. And uh, so we, what we see here is that we find that the, the knockouts, the strongest effects are non-HSP90 co-chaperon, but we also find this protein here in that C that was not very well studied and not very well characterized. So we, we went a bit more on the biology on this, and it turns out that the knockout of NOTC is a, has actually a stronger effect on GR activity than the HOP protein that I presented you earlier, and even has an effect on cell survival. So when NOTC is knocked out, eventually the cell die much quicker than, when, than with other co-chaperon of HSP90. So the protein is essential and is linked to GR activation. If we look structurally, we don't know much about this protein. It has a domain of an unknown function and a co region that are involved in dimerization. The, the protein is always dimeric uh, in vitro and in the cell. Uh, and it has a CS domain that is a domain very often found in HSP90 co-chaperons. So to understand a bit more, again, our collaborators did co-immunoprecipitation with this protein. And the partner that they found is, of course, not C itself. It's a dimerizing protein. That's not very surprising, but we also find HSP40s and HSP90. So there is a clear link between this protein and uh, HSP90 and HSP70 systems. So just to summarize the protein I'm gonna talk about today, we have the HSP40s that interact in two points with HSP70. We then have HSP90 that is connected to the system via HOP that interacts simultaneously with the set mini of HSP90 and HSP70. And what we want to understand is where does NOTC sit uh, within this network? And I will start to describe our results on, on HSP40. So we started with a very simple experiment, uh, again, from our collaborators. We did analytical ultrasound centrifugation with fluorescently labeled NOTC. So that gives us the sedimentation coefficient of the protein that's linked to the size. And then on that, we can add unlabeled proteins like HSP40. And what we see is an increase in size, let's say, of NOTC which tells us that those two protein interact in vitro. Um, we can go a bit further with this. We can try to break this interaction by adding subconstructs of NOTC. And we just chop the protein in two. And what we see is that the N-terminal half of NOTC has no effect on the complex while the C-terminal half breaks down the complex. So we know that the binding site must be contained in this region. Um, so from there, we, we started our work. We started with the NMR. We assign uh, this first half of the protein, you see the spectrum here. From there, we can already look at the topology that actually shows us that the topology that was predicted for, whoop, this protein was wrong. Uh, we actually have four helices instead of this long coil coil. And on the spectrum, what you don't see here is that there is a very high dynamic range. So we have very low intensity peak and very high intensity peak in the spectrum. And if we plot those along the sequence, the three first helix are actually the low intensity peak while the, the fourth one has very high intensity. So it tells us that the dimerization region actually includes the domain of unknown function and the call call region. And this elix alpha four is very flexible in solution. So that's good, we could refine the topology, but what we are really interested in is the interaction with HSP40. So we did titration. This is what you see here. We can just plot the intensity changes upon addition of HSP40. And what we see is that this Cdx alpha 4 is uh, as really the strongest effects with almost no intensity anymore after addition of HSP40. We can do the reverse titration looking at HSP40. And for this, we teamed up with uh, the Rosenzweig lab that has the assignment for HSP40. We could do the titration with full and not C and show that the main binding site is this CTD1 region. So we have identified by NMR the, the 
uh, binding site for the two protein. From there, we can create minimal construct that we can use to crystallize the complex. And so we obtain the crystal structure. Uh, it fits perfectly with what we expect from the NMR. We have the helix alpha four of Nazi that binds this CTD1 region. But what we didn't expect is this uh, beta amplification here. And it's something that we actually know about because it's exactly the way that HSP70 binds to HSP40. And the sequence is actually very similar. But where in HSP70, we have the C-terminus of the protein. In the case of Nazi, we have the start of the helix alpha four that comes in and creates extra, uh, extra interactions. So just to summarize this part, we have refined the topology of Nazi. We have shown the dimerization region. And we have shown that we have this helix alpha four here that comes in and interact with CTD1 of HSP40 on the exact same spot as HSP70 and likely compete uh, with it for the binding. So we then continue with HSP90. We used a very similar pipeline. So we started with analytical centrifugation. We can uh, make the complex with HSP90. And from there, we can try to compete out this complex. And what we see here is that actually the C terminal region in that case contains the binding site to HSP90. It's expected since we have this CS domain. Again, we can go to the NMR, assign the, the backbone. We have to use multiple constructs for this. We can get the topology that is, uh, we have a CS domain that is exactly in the fold expected from the crystal structure. But what we also observed that was not expected is that we have two large helices in the C terminus of the protein. So from there, we can go to interaction with HSP90. As I told you, HSP90 is a large protein, not very easy to handle. So we just use a single domain for this protein and we did the titration. So we just use, in gray, you have the reference spectrum and in color after addition of the domain of HSP90. And what you can see is that when we add either the NTD region or the CTD region, we have no effect. But when we add the middle domain, we lose all our intensity, which tells us that this is the binding site. So we can go back, do actual titration, get chemical shift perturbation, uh, map them on the sequence and on the structure. And what we can see is a very nice delineated surface that must be our binding site to the middle domain of HSP90. We can of course do the reverse titration since we have the assignment now of the middle domain of HSP90. And in that case too, we get very strong shift that we can plot on the sequence and report on the structure. And what we observe here is again, a fairly well delineated interface around this region of the beta one, beta two, alpha two region of HSP90. Uh, so we have the interface on both protein and from there we can try to model the complex. Um, so we have also the crystal structure of the, of the isolated protein and we used ad hoc with the interface as um, ambiguous restraint to create the model. We of course obtain a model that fits very well with the chemical perturbation that's expected because they are an input in the modeling. So we have to validate this. And for this, we used a uh, paramagnetic NMR. So there is a naturally occurring sustain on this domain that we can label with IPSL. And then we can look at intermolecular NOE, uh, I'm sorry, intermolecular PRE on the middle domain. And if we plot the, the measured PRE with the one expected from the model, we see that it fits fairly well. Uh, so we have validated our complex with PRE. And of course, just after I finished this work, Alpha fold came out. <laughs> and of course, alpha fold predicts the interaction perfectly, which is good for us. It's an extra validation that the, the complex seems correct at least. Um, okay, so we have shown the complex with the isolated domain, but with HSP90, we absolutely have to validate it in the full lens protein. And this is where the methyl assignment comes in. So we can now look at isoleucine and methionine. That's a slightly more affordable sample that still gives us around 53 uh, methyls that are well spread over the structure. It gives very nice spectrum. We can just add the full lens Nazi on it. And as you can see, many of the peak are uh, not affected, but some of them are very strong shifts. So if we report this on the sequence, the we have a very similar conclusion as with the isolated domain. The N-terminus domain is not affected by the addition of Nazi, but and most of the perturbation are observed in the middle domain. And if we plot this on the structure, we find the same binding site around this beta one, beta two, alpha two region. But what we could not see with the isolated domain is this extra perturbation that are localized here at the MC interface. And of course this in the isolated domain doesn't exist. Um, so we wanted to understand what's happening in this region and for this, we went back, we repeated our methyl uh, titration experiment with different construct of Nazi. 
So this is what I just show you. We also tried the C-terminal alpha of C, and what we could see is the exact same uh, perturbation patterns, which, tells us, which really tells us that the uh, pool binding is performed by this C-terminal alpha of the protein. We also used another construct that is essentially the full lens protein just missing these two C-terminal helices. And what we observe in that case is that we still have the binding, we still have perturbation, but the only localized in this beta one, beta two, alpha two region, and we lose is this, this extra perturbation at the MC interface. So what it tells us is that the binding site, the main binding site is this CS domain to the uh, beta one, beta two region, but we probably have extra, probably transient interaction that happens between the MC interface and these C-terminal helices. Uh, so just to summarize, yeah, this is what I said actually, the CS domain is the main binding site to MD, and we probably have some extra interaction between the C-terminal helices and the MC interface. And this is something that AlphaFold does not predict. So 1.4 NMR, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we've, we've looked at the interaction of Nazi with the HSP90 on one end and HSP40 on the other end, but can those two protein interact simultaneously to uh, Nazi? And we went back again to methyl labeling. This time we labeled NUTC with only isolescine. So that gives us only 11 methyls on the protein, but they are very well spread along the sequence. So we can actually see every substructure. So we can assign those and we can then do titration again. So we can just add HSP40. And what we see is that it binds only in this alpha four region, which we expect. If we add HSP90, we have lots of intensity in the CS region, but also slightly on the C-terminal helices, really what we expect. And if we add the two proteins simultaneously, what we observe is that we lose intensity in both binding sites, which shows us that we really have a binding site. We really have Nazi that is able to connect HSP40 to HSP90 directly. So until now, I really focused on the uh, structure and the interaction of this protein, but now I would like to talk a bit about the, the function of Nazi and what the effect does it have on client. And for this, we have to use very large cocktail of chaperones. So that's a bit difficult to do with NMR. So we have to go back to more biochemical, uh, biochemical approach. So we used again our analytical ultracentrifugation approach. But this time, instead of labeling Nazi, we labeled GR, so the client. And what we want to see is what happens to the client with different cocktails of uh, chaperone and co-chaperones. So for example, if we add HSP40, we have this complex that is formed that is expected, GR binds HSP40. If we add HSP70, we get a very uh, high molecular weight complex that contains HSP70, HSP40, and a client. Again, that's a non-complex and that's expected. But if we add NUTC to this, what we see is actually a reduction in sedimentation coefficient. And so we try to identify what happens here. And it turns out that the complex that is formed is NUTC bind, bound to HSP40, bound to GR without HSP70. So when we add NUTC on this complex, what happens is that NUTC kicks out HSP70 from the complex and uh, comes in interact with HSP40 and GR. And this is something we expect from the crystal structure and from our interaction studies. But what is uh, more interesting here is that the client remain bound to HSP40 and NUTC and does not remain bound to HSP70. And this is something that was fairly unexpected. Um, we can go even more complex with this. We can now mix GR with all our chaperone, HSP40, HSP90, and HSP70. What we get is two population. One is the 70 complex here, and one is actually the, the client bound to HSP90 by itself. So it's something we know. This client actually can bind to HSP90 by itself uh, to a certain extent. And if we add NUTC to this, we get a single population again that is located here that we can assign to the complex of NUTC bound to HSP40, the client and HSP90. So what happens here is very similar. We have NUTC, HSP70 is kicked out, the client is retained, and the HSP40 complex is brought to HSP90. Um, so we can clearly show a direct link between HSP40 and HSP90 with this core chaperone. Um, what surprised us is that the client remains bound to HSP40 and, and NUTC. And so for this, we uh, went back to the NMR and we did titration between NUTC, uh, so the C-terminal alpha of NUTC and the client. And it turns out that we actually have some effects. We lose intensity and we've plot this on the sequence. 
where we lose intensity is in this C-terminal helices. So the client seems to bind the C-terminal helices of NUTC on its own. And we can even repeat this by pre-incubating the client with HSP40, so already bind it to HSP40, but it still binds the, the Koshafon, it still binds NUTC in this case. And the, the effect on intensity is actually stronger from, I mean, we expect this from a bigger complex. We can look at this from the methyl, it's, it's very similar results, but essentially when we add GR, we have a shift of this peak that is in the, in the C-terminal helices. So it's small, but it's clearly visible. When we add the NGB1, we lose intensity also on this peak. This is what we observe here. But if we add the NGB1 and GR simultaneously, we get the loss of intensity that is induced by HSP40, but we also get the shift that is induced by GR. So it really shows that in addition to these interactions, we also have the client that can bind to HSP40 and to NUTC simultaneously. Okay, so just to finish one thing, we looked at the transfer, uh, the transfer of the client, uh, but what about the effect of NUTC on the folding of the client? And so we have one last biochemical assay that we can use. So GR, when it's folded, bind to uh, dexamethasone. And we can have the, this fluorescent label. So we can follow the, the folding of the client by adding this, uh, this uh, hormone. And we can just follow uh, fluorescence and isotropy here and see the binding. So if you can see, if we just add the two together, we can clearly see the binding of the hormone to GR that happens. If we add HSP40 and HSP70 together, well, the client gets unfolded and the hormone is released. So that's what we see here. We see the release of the hormone and the unfolding on GR. And so from there, we can just try to add different cocktails of chaperon and co-chaperons to try to um, refold the client. And so this is what we did. If we add HSP90, uh, if we add HSP90, we have a slight refolding that happens. Uh, as I said before, the client can bind HSP90 on its own, so that helps slightly. If we add NUTSI, we already have quite a good increase in refolding, uh, and that's due to the fact that NUTSI is kicking out HSP70 from the complex and so blocks this unfolding capacity. But if we add NUTSI and HSP90 together, we basically go back to the full folding of the client. And this effect is much stronger than the sum of the isolated effect of the two proteins. So we, we really have synergy here that really helps the client refolding when it's unfolded and really show that those two protein works together. So just to summarize all this, when we started the project, the only path that was known to connect a client from HSP70 to HSP90 was this Koshapon hop that connects the two systems together uh, through HSP70. But what we've shown here is that we have an alternative path from through NUTSI that is on one end able to bring directly kind clients from HSP40 to HSP90, but also that's able to, to affect this complex to bring the client to HSP90. And so now we know that we have at least two pathways that allows the client to be brought to uh, HSP90. And the one thing also that this paper adds is that it's the first time that we actually have a direct effect of HSP40 to HSP90. So it opens up a whole new range of regulation of the protein that we're not expected before. So this work was published and, and um, previewed recently in molecular cell. So with this, I would like to thank all the people that have worked on this project. Of course, uh, Michael Sattler and everyone in the lab. So my, Michael for hosting me and everyone else to helping me with the different part of the project. I would like to thank our HSP90 specialists. So from the Buchner lab that are across the street and our HSP40 collaborators from the Rosenzweig lab and also our collaborators that set up the CRISPR essay and also uh, collaborators that set up FRET essay that I didn't present uh, today. And I would like to thank you for your attention.